My name is Julia Hayden, and I'm the Associate Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. I'm very pleased to see all of you here this evening for our 15th annual Clark Lecture in the Humanities, this year featuring um, writer and wilderness advocate Doug Peacock. The Clark Lectureship was named after former UO President Robert D. Clark, and it was established in 1994 with the stated purpose of, quote, promoting public discussion of the natural sciences, the history of Oregon, and the interface between science and cultural affairs. Over the years, the Clark Lectureship has allowed the Oregon Humanities Center to bring to campus many wonderful writers, environmentalists, scientists, historians, including, just to name a few of them, David James Duncan, Kathleen Dean Moore, Terry Tempest Williams, Richard Louvre, William Cronin, and now tonight our special guest, Douglas Peacock. When thinking about this year's Humanities Center theme of conflict, which you see on the banner here behind me, um, and the focus of the Clark Lectureship, that is uh, the natural world and the humanities, um, it occurred to me that the conflict between humans and animals, particularly large predator species, and the problem of, of habitat loss and human encroachment upon the land that provides an ever dwindling habitat for a number of species would be an interesting topic for tonight's lecture. So I contacted former Clark lecturer Terry Tempest Williams and I asked whom she would recommend to speak on this theme. And she said her number one choice without question would be Doug Peacock. So I thought, well, that's a good enough endorsement for me. So I chased Doug down, and fortunately, he was able and willing to come to Eugene and share a few stories with us tonight about the impact. <laughs> You're welcome. The impact of climate change and the importance of preserving grizzly bears and other species, and together with the last uh, remaining bits of true wilderness, the habitat for these creatures and us. So I'm going to leave the honor of introducing Doug, actually, to his longtime friend and fellow writer, Professor Carol Ann Bassett from our School of Journalism. But before I turn the podium over to Carol, and there are just a couple of housekeeping items that I need to mention to you. By the way, is the sound um, sufficient on the microphone? Great, thank you. Um, and you'll have to let us know again when speakers change. So let us know if you're not hearing Doug in the back. We, we want to get it right for you rather than have you struggle to hear all evening. So the first item of business is that there will be a book sale and signing after the lecture. There's a table out in the lobby right outside where you came in where books are available if you don't already have your dog-eared copy of Grizzly Years. There are many books there in addition to Grizzly Years. Um, and the signing will take place up in the front of the room. We'll move this little table forward. So at the end of the Q&A and when the lecture is over, you can go out and purchase books and then we'll probably have people line up in this aisle for the signing. Um, second, you will notice that there are two microphones here in the main aisles, and um, if you would like to ask a question during the Q&A period following Doug's formal presentation, we ask that you use one of these microphones. Um, this lecture is being taped, and it is also um, being live streamed on the web tonight. And so um, people will not be able to hear your question. We also have an overflow room upstairs. Are, is there anybody up there? Uh, not yet. Uh-huh. So in any case, it's important that your, your question be amplified so that not only the people in this room can hear it, but people remotely who are watching the lecture online or elsewhere. Um, so if you're unable to come to either one of the aisle mics and you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand and someone from the OHC staff will bring you a handheld microphone so you can ask your question that way. Um, and we appreciate your help with this logistical detail. I know a lot of people don't like microphones, but it will benefit everyone if your question is audible. 
Third, um, if you are not currently on either of our mailing lists, we have an email list and a regular old-fashioned snail mail list, and you would like to be, um, you can provide us with your contact information. We have a table out in the lobby to the left as you go out the door. It's got a beautiful display, so you, you won't be able to miss it. And we, have, um, we will take either your email address or your uh, regular mailing address or both. So the other thing I have to say is if you enjoy the programs of the Oregon Humanities Center and would like to help support our work, we'd be more than happy to accept your gifts. You'll find giving envelopes on our table out in the back as well. Then finally, I would like to offer my sincere thanks to the staff of the Oregon Humanities Center. The, the fabulous staff were a real team and we couldn't do what we do without working together on every single project we undertake. Um, they, Pro Professor Carol Ann Bassett, who will introduce Doug, and I'd just like to thank you again for being here tonight. Thank you for coming out on this lovely evening. If you've not seen the moon, it is um, absolutely gorgeous. I would like to begin by thanking the Oregon Humanities Center for making this lecture possible. I, uh, I, they have been working very hard to bring writers and activists such as Doug Peacock here and succeeded much to our delight. Uh, let me start by asking a question. Are there any veterans in the audience? Please raise your hands. Okay. All right. Well, we are honored tonight to have as our guest a fellow veteran and one of my favorite defenders of wildlife, Doug Peacock. Doug is a man who has spent the last several decades scrambling through remote forests and mountains, fording swollen streams, and entering the dens of grizzly bears to learn how they live and die. And to reclaim his troubled soul. In doing so, he has awakened in others the plight of his magnificent endangered species and taught us why it is so important to protect it. Now, like most of us, forgive me, Doug, <laughs> Doug Peacock is in many ways a paradox. He is a renegade naturalist with the fortitude of a bear and the heart of a fawn. As a Special Forces Green Beret medic in Vietnam, Peacock experienced the devastation of war firsthand, walking point, dodging the spray of, marine, of machine guns, and marine guns, probably. <laughs> Watching his friends die in his arms and literally suturing the wounded by stitching body parts together. He tried to make sense of the madness. He had won the Vietnam Cross of Gallantry, the Soldier's Medal, and the Bronze Medal but what he didn't fully realize at the time was that he had joined the ranks of the walking wounded in an era when post-traumatic stress syndrome had not even been defined. Like so many war veterans, Doug Peacock returned home to a deeply fractured society that he had no desire to re-enter. He had found more peace in the monkey-filled jungles of Southeast Asia, where the melodies of songbirds lightened his heavy heart. 
Back on U.S. soil, he w began to withdraw, and then he gathered up his yellowed maps of remote wilderness areas in Montana, Wyoming, Arizona, and Mexico, and ventured alone into the heart of grizzly country, once again courting the razor's edge of danger. But Doug Peacock found solace in the grizzlies. On a very primal level, he experienced reverence, awe, and respect for these creatures. In his book, Grizzly Years, he wrote, Sitting in a major mountain storm in search of what some regard as the fiercest animal on the continent instills a certain humility, an attitude that pries open in me a surprising receptiveness. My journey had ended here in grizzly country, the empty space on the map I thought I'd never find. I was a traveler in an older, more complete world. The Indians thought that these bears were gods sent down to earth to make men humble. It was no accident I had arrived. It was no accident indeed. In the grizzly, Doug Peacock discovered reverence and a new sense of purpose. The, there is a myth of Doug Peacock being the same as George Washington Hay Duke, the kind of uh, radical eco-saboteur in his good friend Ed Abbey's book, The Monkey Wrench Gang. But Abbey in time knew in his heart that Doug Peacock is a very different breed of warrior. He's what Joanna Macy, a Buddhist scholar, environmental activist, and follower of deep ecology would call a bodhisattva warrior, a wisdom being, motivated by the compassion for all life. Today, our knowledge of grizzlies is much deeper because of Doug Peacock's courage to become the true warrior he was intended to be. It was a Dharma thing, the unmistakable calling to protect these creatures before it's too late. Doug lived almost invisibly in the grizzly bear's world. He immersed himself in their habitat, learned their behavior, and even their language. And in doing so, he developed a lasting kinship with Ursus Horribilis. As he remarked at dinner last night, my bears are my bears. Every year, I see my bears. Peacock is one of those rare individuals who lives and writes from the heart. A man who conveys passion with integrity, authority, and grace. His words and actions make clear that it's in Homo sapiens' best interest to protect grizzlies and their dwindling habitat because our own destiny with grizzlies is more closely connected than we may imagine. And by being brave enough to be among grizzlies, to live among grizzlies, the bears transmitted to him what he'd so long been searching for, the dawning of spiritual renewal. Doug Peacock is the author of four books, Grizzly Years, In Search of the American Wilderness, Baja, Walking It Off, A Veteran's Chronicle of War and Wilderness, and his latest book written with his wife, Andrea Peacock, The Essential Grizzly, The Mingled Fates of Men and Bears. In 2007, Peacock received a Guggenheim Fellowship and in 2011, last year, he received a Lannan Fellowship for his upcoming book, 
about archaeology, climate change, and those who lived here very long ago. That is the subject of his lecture this evening, which I am sure will anger, delight, and inspire you to action. Please welcome my dear friend, Doug Peacock. Thanks, Carol Ann. Um, well, it, I haven't been in Oregon for some time, but it uh, has always been uh, on my route. For a couple decades, I traveled, uh, traveled down the uh, Willamette uh, to visit in-laws, and then I followed the Columbia back up uh, river, as was my nomadic tradition, uh, to where grizzlies still lived and wild buffalo still roamed. And I have continued that pattern pretty much uh, to the current day. Uh, above all, um, it's that nomadic tradition. And, uh, um, but Oregon, uh, my children spent so much time here. My, uh, my friend, my editor, my published, publisher, Jeff St. Clair, uh, lives here. Um, And, uh, you know, best of all, my, my daughter, Laurel, is here tonight. And uh, that's a, uh, uh, Laurel uh, at one time worked professionally in the wine profession around Napa. And she got a, a lot of her initial training at the Sokol Blosser uh, Vineyard up in the Dundee. And she currently uh, works uh, as an environmental consultant for Blue Sky an Outfit that advises com companies like Walmart on how to be green. It'll come up again. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, that notion of an outsider and a nomad is pretty much uh, speaks to my own unremarkable uh, biography uh, because it's rooted in travel. And as Carol Ann mentioned, I mean, when I came back from Vietnam, like a whole lot of other vets, I was quite out of sorts and not wanting to spend a lot of time with my, with my own, estranged from family and society. The one place I've always been comfortable is the woods. And so I went, and the Rocky Mountains are my home up and down, and uh, so I went, you know, I camped out for several years, and, uh, and uh, as a snow melted, I went further north, and finally, you know, hit the Wind River Range, there's grizzly there now, but there weren't then, and, and as a result of a malaria attack, went to Yellowstone and ran into grizzlies, um, and, uh, you know, I maintained that pattern pretty much every year. When the grizzlies hibernated, I went back down to the desert where I hung out with people like Ed Abbey. And I, I also had a, a decade-long career with the Department of Interior. I can thank Edward Abbey for that. Ed gave me my first uh, occupational advice. He says, Douglas, you should seek seasonal work with the Park Service. They give you a quitting date to look forward to. And so I did, I did, I, and, and uh, I filled out all these applications and I looked at the map and whatnot and I ended up being a backcountry ranger up in the North Cascades and uh, uh, I, within, the, within the Department of Interior I was sort of dominantly mobile, you know, and uh, after a couple of years the backcountry ranger picking places where I didn't see anybody for six weeks, I mean that's a good job. And uh, the last year I was a climbing ranger at Mount Shuxton and during that period I totaled a government pickup truck under dubious circumstances and got in a fight with the uh, deputy county of Whatcom County. So um, I left to the great relief of the Park Service uh, of North Cascade, North Cascade National Park, made my way to Glacier, it had grizzlies, that was the chief factor, and uh, there settled into a GS3 job as a fire lookout, which suited me pretty well, you know, and uh, because it was wet then and, you know, the job, about four minutes a day, you get up and look around for fires and then <laughs> it ended up being a perfect job. And uh, so after seven years of that, I worked myself down to a GS0 and retired forever from the Department of Interior. Um, I should also personally thank uh, especially uh, Julia uh, and Peg and Melissa for putting this together. Um, I'm going to get a little drink of water here. And also, 
uh, one more friend, very close friend, Terry Tempest Williams, without uh, whom I wouldn't probably be here tonight. And, uh, you know, when Terry, people like Terry and me, I brought a picture here for you. Uh, when Terry and me are not, you know, giving lectures, writing books, this is what we do. This is, uh, uh, we brave the wild, riotous waters of British Columbia smoking in big, fat, fine communist cigars, you know. It's, <laughs> right. So thank you, Terry. Uh, and, oh, yeah, and secondly, a note about, a note about the title of this thing. It's really kind of a bad title. And uh, uh, as I remember, it was Rick Bass came up with it. We were sitting around a campfire drinking large quantities of, I think, Yamhel Pinot. I forget what, but lots of it, you know. And uh, uh, so we came up with this smelling century thing. And, uh, um, you know, the fact is it's uh, going to be a little uh, hard to, to, to pin down the parallels. Uh, you know, the, the real question is, what the hell does that mean, you know? Uh, a survivor's guide to melding century, you know? It's not a good run fire, but... It's, it kind of beats my ass, actually, come to think of it. And, uh, you know, I think we claimed a little uh, too much there. But uh, anyway, it's, um, you know, it is, uh, it is a story about uh, climate change. And, uh, you know, climate change is happening now, and it happened before. And um, that's mainly what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, Let's see, is there anything else? Um, anyway, you know, the, the, the connections between the place and today, uh, are, you know, are more parable than, than parallel. And, you know, the, the connections are tenuous, but it's worth looking into. It really is. And much of that is in, in, uh, in, in, in dealing with the place of scene. I mean, the, the period in which my book mainly takes place is about 15 to 13,000 years ago, and a little before then, too. And the most... Uh, you don't know me, but I write memoirs, and, and you know, as opposed to journalism. And, and memoirs, you can lie like hell, you know. And like Ed Abbey, I would never probably let a bunch of important, unimportant facts get in the way of a good story. Well, there's so few hard facts of paleontology and archaeology to pin me down that I could really, you know, have fun with this book a little bit, you know. The fact that it's taken so long is that there are facts involved, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a very good journalist. Uh, Anyway, um, the other thing is why, uh, um, actually I should give you a little idea. I, I'm just going to read a couple uh, paragraphs in the beginning of this book that's drafted about, you know, really the, it's a big subject and we'll just touch on areas tonight. I'm going to splice together some readings, some, uh, you know, far-fetched stories and uh, notebook entries and just... Uh, uh, you know, out of that at least we'll get some questions. But let me just read something here. For the past 12,000 years, we have enjoyed a relatively stable climate. Now the time of predictable global weather has ended. The future will be unsettled, probably fiery, and likely terrifying. Has this kind of climate change happened to humans before? It certainly has. Most recently, right here in North America, when people first colonized the continent. About 15,000 years ago, the weather began to warm, melting the huge glaciers of the late Pleistocene and causing the oceans to rise. You know, the, the methane was escaping from the permafrost, a condition not unlike today. Uh, the Americas were uninhabited by people then, but teeming with gigantic and fierce animals, many capable of killing and eating human beings. In this brand new landscape, the largest of all unoccupied wilderness regions humans would ever explore on Earth, People somehow adapted to unfamiliar habitats and dangerous creatures in the midst of a wildly fluctuating climate. Along the trail of this epic tale I call The Greatest Adventure lie lessons of courage and caution for modern people. <clears throat> Though the rough outline of this journey is delineated by modern science, especially archaeology and paleontology, uh, what really drew me into the wild heart of the story of the first Americans was the adventure. I mean, it, it, it's... It was amazing to think about, you know, wondering what it was like to live with huge pack hunting lions, saber-toothed cats, uh, dire wolves, and gigantic short-faced bears. Uh, these are creatures that went extinct, you know, about 12,900 years ago in a great megafauna extinction. Um, 
but it, uh, t uh, it's, it, you know, what a time that would have been, the wildest time I can imagine in North America. I, 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 uh, I, I love just thinking about being there. And along the trail of, the, of this story that I call The Greatest Adventure, I think lie lessons at least of courage and caution for modern people. And, you know, uh, it was also the largest uh, uninhabited uh, wilderness Amer uh, Homo sapiens would ever colonize, you know. It was, uh, it was uh, the first and only time since Adam and Eve emerged from Eden that our species would come under so vast a land, a wilderness five times the area of Australia, and never before glimpsed by an upright primate. You know, here lived beasts both fierce and wonderful. Some species had not previously encountered people including a number of potential human eaters. The, impl imp in, in, the impalpable force overshadowing all human movements and accommodations to new environments at the end of the Pleistocene was climate change. Uh, today's shifting weather patterns, the shorthand we call global warming, potentially far exceed anything our ancestors faced 15,000 years ago. Uh, one bridge between the past and today, I believe, is the perception of risk. Uh, you know, uh, between today's extreme climatic dangers and the place to see lion that was crouched in the bush waiting for two-legged ice age prey, we evolved to deal with a predator. In comparison, present-day global warming seems distant, harmlessly incremental, or something that happens to remote strangers. For those ancient adventures, however, the saber tooth was right there every day, a pragmatic consciousness of great modern value. Um, you know, the great, the great sadness of my time is, is not only seeing what we have done to this poor, delicate planet, but um, um, trying to understand why human beings have such trouble perceiving which is in their true interest for long-term survival. And I mean psychic, I mean physical. Uh, we, you know, uh, we don't get to the saber tooth in the bush. Um, one br another bridge uh, it, that, that kind of ties all of my various stories together, stories about uh, today's uh, climatic problems and extinctions and uh, the pl late Pleistocene is, you know, the idea of wilderness, you know, and uh, uh, it, it was all wilderness back then. And uh, I really believe that the preservation of wilderness is going to play a crucial role if we're going to make it through this crisis ourselves. You know, my simple idea, it's actually a very simplistic idea, is that, you know, as a species, that's where we evolve. You know, all our physical evolution, the, the, development and refinement of that entity we call the mind was honed in wilderness uh, or in habitats whose remnants today we call the wilderness. And so I think it's, uh, that's why I keep fighting for that. Uh, it, it'll come up throughout uh, tonight's program. Um, let's see. I might read. Oh, yeah. Why? Here's another quandary that I had to face. Why well, write a book about a journey that took place many thousands of years ago before any written record, especially during a time when the world seems on fire? After all, these days are the most dangerous times we've seen in the history of the earth. Beyond the agony of modern wars, disease, poverty, genocide, and starvation, the planet itself and its support systems are in peril. I mean, I know you all know that, but, uh, um, you know, that's what I'd like to address. And I found myself um, struggling, quite frankly. Uh, we are experiencing the largest rate of plant and animal extinction on record, including the massive extinction of the Cretaceous that knocked off the dinosaurs. All around the globe, the air is poisoned and the oceans are acidified, overfished. Climate change threatens all species, including humans. Uh, global warming, which is a catchword in itself, is not a passing phenomenon. It'll still be there at the end of the day and the end of our lives. Revisiting an ancient puzzle and unfolded, you know, 15,000 years ago, might be a waste of time and energy. So again, why go back and track the odyssey of these first bold Americans? Human adaption to climate change is a common underlying theme. 
In my own case, I thought a good adventure story, perhaps with constructive parallelism, might spur us to open our hearts to the undeniable truth that we're now devouring more of the Earth resources than she has to offer. The book is also a celebration of the North American continent, a gripping tale, less prophecy than parable, spun along the lines of exploration in a brand new world beset by the storms of change. The hub of the story reveals radical adaptation by people during another time of extreme climate, the driving force of our evolution. Tracing the movement of the first, America, the first people of the Americas is ultimately an optimistic trip, full of fun and excitement, a message of hope and courage we could all use. You know, uh, and basically that's, uh, I know we got a bear up there, and that's another story all in itself. That one picture, you know, that bear is in the moment of indecision. She is deciding whether or not she should chew my rear end off or not. And, uh, you know, it's kind of an accident. He froze that on that frame. But uh, anyway, you know, uh, I will get to that later if we have time. And, uh, you know, um, you know, and, and there's other stories that I probably won't have time to get into tonight either. You know, we're having, we're working with native peoples up in the British Columbia and having incredible success with creating homeland, traditional homelands, you know, that are essentially uh, wilderness areas on an 8 to 10 million acre level. That's done deal. And that's like four or five Yellowstone parks. That's really good news. About the only good news I know. Yeah. We can thank Round River Conservation Studies for that. Um, but anyway, um, you know, I thought I'd talk about uh, this uh, uh, coming to America stuff tonight. Partly, of course, because it's what I'm working on. But the other real reason was, is that, uh, you know, the oldest unassailable archaeological date in North America was, uh, was worked out and, and developed by the University of Oregon. That uh, the date at the Paisley Cave on... Uh, human tissue on DNA is the most unassailable date. And, and there's other uh, dates, they're called pre-Clovis. You know, the Clovis people were the elephant hunters that presumably came down from Alaska. And, uh, you know, and, and they colonized everywhere. In two or three hundred years, they were everywhere, from Panama to Maine to Florida, you know. Unprecedented explosion, the colonization of the Americas. But before then, there's, you know, a site here and there, a date here and there. They're all pretty much all of them have been contested, if mildly, but Paisley Cave, University of Oregon, is one exception. So that's one reason I came here with this uh, story. Um, the other thing, the other, um, the, uh, th there's one other uh, uh, site that's very close to my home, and it's, it happens to be a Clovis site, you know? And it's a Clovis burial, the Clovis Red Ochre burial. It's the oldest burial in the Americas. It's the only Clovis burial. That means it's about 13,000 years old. And it's, uh, it's very close to my home and close to my heart. Um, along with two archaeologist friends, I, it, it, it's called the Anzic site. And it was a red ochre child burial with 115 of the most spectacular Clovis artifacts anybody ever saw. And this child, all, you know, sacredly doused in red ochre. And uh, because it was uncovered by workmen in 1968, and because Montana is pretty far from the academic archaeological centers of the universe, it was really dismissed in the literature throughout the 90s when I first became aware of it. And so along with two archaeologist friends, I organized a re-excavation of that site in 1999. And, uh, you know, um, and uh, actually I got, uh, I, you know, I got Outside Magazine to, to put up the expense money in exchange for an article which I wrote for him. You know, this is hardly a scientific journey. A journal, but uh, it did open the eyes to others, especially professional, uh, professional archaeologists that swarmed in like uh, carrion birds from afar, scrambling, and, and, and it's a disgusting story, scrambling for the child's bones. And if anybody cares about NAPRA or repatriation or Native American rights, they come and talk to me because everybody ignored everything about this. This poor child's skeleton has been scattered to the four winds and Everybody's grinding it up for, you know, like dinosaurs for Chinese medicine. It's a, but I'm not, I can't talk about that. But if anybody's got an inkling, get a hold of me later. We'll take these bastards on, okay? 
<clears throat> Sorry, I, I wasn't supposed to get animated there. Um, <laughs> and okay, and, and this this Clovis burial is arguably the most important archaeological sites in in North America, and it quite possibly the oldest site, arguably the oldest site. Um, there are older dates, but you know there's contention and everything. It also really, uh, you know, the, the it can be proved. Part of this is proven, and part of it can be proven that you know these people came down the corridor, by as evidenced by uh, and, uh, elk antler artifacts. You know more about that later. They definitely came down the corridor and. They probably developed the Clovis projectile point. You know, it's a big deal. It's like the holy grail of you know, paleoarchaeology is where did Clovis come from? Well, they probably developed it coming down the quarter when they first ran into Mammoth. And that probably is provable from this site and the lithic sources of the material losing the burial. But uh, I'll get into that later uh, a little bit. I wanted to, you know, but here, this kind of frames what I want to talk about tonight. And uh, it's going to be an approximation of. Uh, it's going to be a rough rendering. But, you know, you got Paisley Cave, University of Oregon. People were here about 14,000 years ago. How the hell did they get here? You know, the glaciers were slammed shut then. So, you know, they had a couple ways of getting here. They could either have come down before the glaciers closed, you know, before the last glacial maximum in North America is about 19,000 years ago. But maybe, uh, you know, uh, 4,000 years before then it was probably open. The other way they could have come down is by the coast. And the, the same thing from the Montana site. How did the people get down there? Well, they probably came down a quarter. Uh, that's a little more demonstrable. The, f the fact is there's no evidence whatsoever to prove any of these things. It's all, you know, it's, uh, it's a little more than speculation, but uh, th we don't have any hard evidence of any of these routes, but it's fascinating stuff, and I don't doubt they used all these, these routes. So, so I thought I'd talk about uh, uh, this stuff. Um, and listen, um, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to read some stuff from my notebooks and, uh, and uh, I'll say something about Ed Abbey while I'm here. And if we have time, we'll watch a few minutes of wild grizzly footage, okay? And uh, it's just MOS. It's no movie. It's just uh, it's a old crude work print. Uh, but discussion is going to, you know, hone around, you know, how people got here. Well, what's the big picture in the peopling of the America? What's the, you know, the... The big picture is that Homo sapiens came out of Africa about 70,000 years ago, probably escaping a series of droughts, perhaps brought on by gigantic volcanic eruption in Sumatra. Um, and it probably went through a population bottleneck then. Some geneticists think it was Homo sapiens went down to the thousands. And uh, anyway, they started leaving Africa. They crossed the Red Sea maybe 65,000 years ago. That suggests boats. Uh, they bypassed uh, Europe because the Neanderthals were there. Or for whatever reason, they bypassed uh, Europe and headed east. Um, <clears throat> where once they got to Indonesia and Southeast Asia, they, they uh, paddled down south to Australia. And some people think they might have gotten to Australia 60,000 years ago or even possibly a little earlier. But anyway, and so you've got these people, uh, Homo sapiens, with marine... Um, you know, with marine capabilities. They probably had nets and they probably fished. You know, um, in, in intermediate and a glacial stage when, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when the, the seas are rising and, you know, like a, like a tidal wave, you know. Uh, there are shallow seas over the continental shelves. Those are very productive waters. Assuming the use of nets, it'd be a breeze, you know, to, to fish your way successfully to Australia, and they had to cross open water where they couldn't see a damn thing. I mean, this is very sophisticated stuff. And so the question is, um, uh, well, you know, after that, by 40,000 years ago, everybody was on the move. Homo sapiens were moving into Europe. They were getting to the Arctic. You know, they got to the north end of the Ural Mountains 40,000 years ago. They got to Siberia 30,000 years ago. and. Uh, so you've got people with a marine capability sitting on the South China Sea sunning themselves for 50,000 years. I mean, why the hell didn't they want to go on and explore and come around to the Americas? Because, you know, basically by 40,000 years ago, um, uh, 30,000 years ago anyway, you know, they, uh, the Homo sapiens had colonized every continent except uh, Antarctica and North and South America. And, you know, the question is, why not? What stopped them? Or didn't they try? 
I can't imagine sitting there sunning yourself for 50,000 years without wanting to go up the coast and poke around a little bit. So, um, you know, that's, that's my notion. Um, it's, it's, you know, in, in, as Paisley demonstrates, there's, uh, there was a pre-Clovis presence in North America, and there's other sites too, and, and, and they prob uh, half a dozen hold up, I'm sure. Uh, but while there's evidence that people survived, there's no evidence these people thrived. There's no evidence they, they ever lived in great numbers. And so, you know, again, why didn't uh, they come around by boat and uh, settle down at uh, Santa Monica and, uh, you know, build sedentary villages? You know, you can live off marine resources really easy. You clams, mussels, and oysters with a technology of sticks and stones, you pump out babies. Well, apparently, either it's underwater or we've never found it. Anyway, it, it's, a, it's something I love to think about myself. Um, and of course, my suspicion is that they did come and poke around the shores of North America and South America, and they didn't land much. And I think the reason is zoology. You know, uh, the, uh, you know, anybody stopping in in Siberia, well, what they call Beringia is that vast area that the land straits and in part of Siberia and much of that. Alaska up north. And, you know, anybody stopping off in Beringia would see, you know, huge pack hunting lions. They're twice as big, same genus, but twice as big as the African lion with big skulls, big craniums. It's suggesting they were social animals, 100 in packs. And these were, these were no pussycats. And, you know, we had all kinds of saber tooths that were solitary hunters. But the most fearsome animal, probably of all, was a gigantic short faced bear. The short faced bear was an animal when standing was, you know, big ones would be about 15 feet tall. They weighed over a ton. Some people speculate up to 3,000 pounds. Uh, they had gracile bone structures, but very long legs, seven foot at the hip. And, you know, it's, in, in, it's it, uh, Arctotus, uh, the, the genus, kind of means running bears, you know, and, and uh, um, that, that's an animal to keep your uh, eye on. Um, Let's see, I'm just watching my time here. Um, so, how did people get to Oregon? And, you know, there's two ways. And the first of that is, is they came down before the glacier slammed shut. This is sometimes called a pre-maximum or pre, you know, glacial maximum, you know, which it uh, means uh, uh, people were adapted to the Arctic in Siberia. They lived on a Yana River 30,000 years ago. That's quite a ways west of the Bering Strait, but, you know, coastal people, Arctic people have made long, uh, you know, latitudinal runs uh, before, and they could have then. But when they got to, uh, you know, once they got to the open tundra of, uh, okay, I'm going to pile around because I'm looking for a reading here. Let's see. I'm not going to read that. We don't have enough time. But, um, okay, here, I got my, I got my act together again. Um, you know, once they got to the open tundra of Alaska, say 27,000 years ago, um, it, was, it, was, it was not a, a steppe community, it was, it was tundra. And, uh, you know, botanists have uh, argued that uh, that's what really stopped human beings, uh, the lack of shrubs to start bone fires. And uh, again, um, I doubt this very much. Um, you know, but obviously the key, you know, the ability to build a fire at any moment was uh, at, during all seasons in all landscapes it would have been the key to surviving that dry tundra up there. And, uh, you know, but, but again, what, uh, what is missing here is, is there are vast peach beds, for instance, in Alaska. There were, there were skeletal remains of animals all over the place. It was, you know, there, there's a contradiction between the, uh, the people that study pollen and the landscape they think was there was barren on the other end, paleontologists find bones of every damn big thing you can imagine up there. Horses and camels and tapirs and, and uh, you know, llamas and uh, mammoths and mastodon. And, well, mastodon were many down south in the forest, but I mean, it was full of critters. So something was going on there, and human beings could have lived up there. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, so there's skeletal material and dung drying all over the place, you know, enough that once you got a fire going, you could bring in dung from the, you know, but again, starting a fire 
um, you know, at the drop of a hat, especially when a short-faced bear is coming over a rise, was really the key to survival up there. And to do that, um, you know, uh, people would have to, uh, you know, people would have to dry out peat. And, and there's lots of peat up there. I've seen it myself. It's in cut banks. And, you know, and one peat deposit is huge. Peat is dried organic matter, you know, fossilized beds. But, you know, it, it, we dry it out and it burns hot and quick. And you can start a fire with that. And you can get dung, dried dung, the same thing. You dry it first and you can get dung burning. And that's a, the, the combination is a hot enough fire to get the greenest bones. Uh, and I'm just assuming these people hunted waterfowls so much and big mammals. And, you know, green bone burns so much hotter than dried bone. But uh, you, you could get all this stuff uh, going, you know, and, and have every adult carry, you know, enough fire starter, fire drills and flints to keep things going. Um, you know, that... Um, the, the challenge is carrying, carrying sufficient dry fuel on your back in order to quickly build a fire in an emergency, like a pack of big prowling Pleistocene lions, a saber tooth, or a giant short faced bear coming over the rise to appropriate your camel kill. These events might have been daily problems 26,000 years ago. Your defensive tools are spears, throwing sticks, and probably nets and bolos. Most of all, it had social cohesion and fire. So I've interjected some dork stories that I made up myself into this narrative. So these people are moving through the landscape, and, they, and the best hunting country is the interior of Alaska, not the tundra. A quarter mile ahead, one of the advanced lookout signals from a ridge with one hand outstretched and flat over his nose, the other arm overhead with the index finger pointed up. Fictional, but uh, similar to the grizzly bear signals I use with my traveling companion today. Meaning, a solitary short-faced bear, as opposed to a family group or uh, a couple of sub-adults, um, is approaching. The band quickly gathers up the stragglers and looks for defensible terrain. A cliff would be best, but they are far from the mountains. A steep ravine leads away from the braided river and heads up to a 20-foot box. It's a defile, which means a fight, but the people like these odds better than facing Arctotus simus on open ground. The giant bear mainly feeds on the kills of lions and other predators, but he has nothing against carrying on a hoof or foot either. He might snag a human traveling solo with his superior speed. Solitary predators like mountain lions, including some large omnivores, such as bears, can't afford to brawl casually, as an injury could impede their survival, their ability to kill prey and fight for meat at carcasses implying that people have a chance against a gigantic bear. These two species are brand new to each other. Until hitting Alaska, neither had seen anything so strange as the standing 15-foot high bear or an upright hominid. The bear has no reason to fear the puny two-legged ones. You know, two notable animals never crossed the Bering Strait. Uh, in America, it was a short-faced bear, and it was a woolly rhinoceros on the Siberian side. For whatever reason, they never crossed. and so. You know, that is, that's a, the surface bear, bears are a uniquely American uh, specimen. The women of the band herd the children into the ravine, almost to the end of the earthen box canyon. The men prepare their weapons in a fire near the mouth of the short ravine, just far up enough the gulch where the short-faced bear can't drop in from the top. The women cut the emergency steps in the tundra at the head of the draw, where, if the giant bear overruns the men, they might scramble out of the gulch and regroup for the running fight. The two scouts rejoin the group, but stay on the high ground where they can <clears throat> see the approaching Bruin. And if the beast insists on going up the ravine after the people throw great rocks at his head, they gather a pile of boulders. If the band could hide downwind, the short-faced bear might pass them. It prefers rotten meat and has a best nose in the places in animal kingdom, so it likely no humans are around. The leaders of the band watch and wait until they are certain the bear knows where they are. The two hunters try and draw the attention of the short-faced bear away from the band. Arctotus doesn't fall for the distraction. Since sensing greater numbers of prey or another appealing smells, he beelines to the mouth of the ravine. He is met with men with spears and bolos. The Beringians poke fire-sharpened spears at both sides of this great omnivore. A bolo stone strikes the animal near the snout. The bear lumbers forward. The men fall back behind the fire line and all stoke the flames. Now is the moment. 
Two hunters hurl their burning spears at the gigantic bear. The scouts throw great rocks from above, pelting the Bruin about the head and back. These wounds are minor, but the short-faced bear retreats from the blazing fire line, twirls, and ambles back out of the ravine. The people gather on a river terrace and watch the feared animals swing down the green Pleistocene Valley. The bear will find another meal. The bear most fears the short-faced bears at the moment they bring down prey, a large herbivore, such as the horse or caribou. At such times, only fire keeps the scavenging wolves and bears away until they can strip as much meat as they can from the carcass and carry the meat away to a safe shelter and storage caches. The huge lions are just as dangerous as the bear. The cats hunt in prides and bring down any animal that slows or strays away from the herd. That applies to bands of hunters. They stick together and watch the children carefully. The other way the Paisley people could have come down to Oregon is down the coast. And this is probably the most probable thing. Again, there's not an ounce of evidence suggesting that. Um, but no doubt there's some out there. It's either underwater or on rebounded uh, headlands, isostatic rebound from the weight of the glaciers, or maybe in high caves up on the, on the beach. Um, so, you know, that's the second way down. Um, <clears throat> Uh, mainstream uh, geologists, uh, archaeologists have, uh, have le most recently stated that they probably walked down since the, uh, since the now uh, uh, submerged coast would have been an easier time. Um, and, you know, the average, I mean, the water was 300 to 400 feet shallower back in the, in the, when the glaciers were at their maximum. And, you know, an average of like 360 is often given. But I still find that argument really, really weak. Um, and, you know, because as much water was melting off those huge glaciers now, a little more than is melting today. And so it doesn't matter. You know, the, uh, you know, the, the continental shelf would have been, you know, full of huge canyons, either occupied, you know, the giant fjords, either occupied by, uh, you know, by salt water or the heads of glaciers, you know, it was one or the other. And uh, I don't think anybody could have made it with, uh, without a boat. But anyway, I've had to, uh, I put uh, together a couple of stories here. Let's see here. Well, I've got my own notebooks. I, I, the coast is such a bloody easy place to live. I don't know if you've ever been up there. It's the easiest place I know of to live off the land. It's just a Garden of Eden. So anyway, these are from my 1990 notebooks. I started doing conservation work up there about then. You know, this led in part with, God, big hunks of wilderness, uh, working with the uh, Helsuk Indians in the Central Coast and the Taku River Tlingit way up north, uh, you know, near the Yukon border. The canoe plows through the slate gray sea in the lee of an island in an un in a unoccupied archipelago off the coast of British Columbia. A few miles ahead, I can see the full brunt of the Pacific Ocean blast through the narrow strait that separates this land from another further south. The late afternoon sun squints through the same gap. I hug the shoreline and start looking for a suitable cove where I can find food, firewood, and set up for the night. Tomorrow, I'll check out the weather and scout a crossing down to the next island chain. It's only a couple of miles of exposure, but you have to watch the tides and weather carefully. Mornings are the best time to cross the treacherous narrows since it must be near calm to risk these open waters and safely island hop southward. A kayak would be better, though a canoe would do. And I prefer the canoe just because it's pretty close. People probably had silkian bull boats back then, probably. We have no evidence of that, but that makes sense. And so here I am in this stupid canoe, you know, kind of getting stranded for a week at a time while the weather settles down. Um, Years to make it down all the way to the Columbia River from the Arctic. Maybe more years than I have left. The toughest section would be rounding Cape Caution into the Queen Charlotte Strait. You'd have to hold tight to the coastline, wait out the bad weather, camp in place during the winters, and live off the land the entire trip to paddle and walk down the coast from Alaska to the lower 48. It's a dream, but it could be done. Ancient people, no doubt, did it many times. Just watching my time a little bit. I'll read a little more of this. I draw the blade through the water and Jay stroked the canoe towards a broad crescent of sand, a small cove a couple of miles from the southern end of the island. A pebbly creek trickle, trickles into a small estuary. I ease the craft into the gentle surf, 
a void of line of black boulders and step out onto the beach. The tide is dropping, but it won't be at its lowest for a couple of hours, just before dark. After unloading two heavy waterproof bags, I pull the canoe to the upper beach and tie it off to the root of a dead snag. I plunge into the forest, which is open and mossy under the towering spruce trees, providing a perfect tent site. Uh, there's black bear up there and grizzlies, and black bear sometimes swim up to these islands, but seldom grizzlies. So I, I check the area out, and then I put up my tent. You know, uh, Summer living is easy on the coast. Short nights yielding to mild days with salmon, steelhead, and candlefish running up the creeks and rivers, berries growing off lush bushes and mushrooms sprouting from fertile soils. But fierce storms blow across the Pacific, and by autumn, the weather can be snarly, windy, and wet, with days getting shorter, dark, low clouds by winter, the claustrophobic night long and cold. I probably wouldn't want a winter here, but you certainly could, by building a cedar lodge and laying in smoked fish and herring roe, hunting a few deer and seals, stashing pemmican, and harvesting edible seaweed and shellfish. I've been coming here to the outer coast of British Columbia on and off for the last couple decades, often traveling with a few friends or family. I use whatever spare boat is available from staff and colleagues who do conservation work up here. When available, a kayak or canoe is more attractive to me than a motorized craft. Paddling solo is not recommended, but I love these rare opportunities for solitude in its most fecund of New World habitats, a child's garden gathering in the wild Pacific coast. Anyway, I hurry up and dig a whole bunch of clams, okay, because it's getting dark. And, uh, you know, the lines, lines of rocks are actually uh, moved by ancient people so they could beach their, uh, you know, the Nootka, uh, you know, Pacific Coast people arguably were the only people who built civilization out of a, you know, hunting and gathering uh, culture. And uh, they, these are lines of rocks. They moved aside so they can get their war canoes in there. After gathering driftwood and stoking the fire against the gathering dew, I place the clams inside a pan of clean water as there's grit in their digestive system. The sun has dropped behind the heavy atmosphere of the Western Pacific. The canoe is well stocked by condiments, with condiments. By dark, the fire is roaring and a large skillet is going with olive oil, the chanterelles, a sliced onion, and half a head of garlic. I like to cook. Uh, anyway, I. I I, I boil the potatoes and add the horse clams and cover the pot. As soon as the clams open, I pluck them out and add more until finished. I blend powdered milk into the mix, mix the spuds, a pinch of hot red pepper, salt, and the juice of three limes. I scrape the clams in the shell with a pen knife, add them to the skillet, and heat the whole thing up until the potatoes are al dente. The wind picks up, and I eat the chowder in front of a blaze of cedar driftwood, listening to the roar of rising surf breaking on the outer coast. Anyway, if you come down, you know, uh, uh, walking, you know, has been proposed for coming down the coast, but uh, I, I uh, you know, I don't always rough it. And I use the sailboats of, uh, lucky me, friends up there who do conservation work, you know, cook gourmet dinners washed down with fine wines where Dungeness Crab is a, is a food group. And I also study you know, the depth finders and fish finders like, you know, holy objects, you know, and, and those fjords, you know, drop straight off. You step off the bank of those and they drop down, you know, 800, 1600 feet. And, uh, you know, and, and we're always looking for sea mounts to fish in or a place to put a, put a uh, shrimp pot down along a cliff. So I, I pay attention to that. And, you know, those fjords, even, you know, there, there, there are, uh, you know how there's rises in a glacier when it kind of chews like a giant python into the, and you know it rises up into uh, you know rises up into a ridge. That's what makes chains of glacial lakes. You know, well the same thing happens in a fjord underwater. But you know the the shallowest places in any of those things are about five six hundred feet. And uh, you know, fourteen thousand years ago, that means ice or an icy cold swim. So either way. But anyway. Sooner or later, coastal voyagers would reach a body of water. Here's another dork story from my uh, notebooks. And this will be the last one, I promise. Uh, would reach a body of water that required boats, big rivers, fjords, or inlets. In my, in my own experience, this includes treacherous rivers that dump directly into the 
deadly rough surf of the Pacific Ocean. On the outer coast of southeastern Alaska, for instance, there's two fascinating sections of coast that are cut by narrow, short, but swift rivers draining from receding glaciers. I wanted to backpack one of these places. If you carried a portable raft, I thought, you might be able to paddle or swim across a river before the current dumped you out into the pounding waves of the open ocean where you would most surely drown. It took me over a decade to get my courage up and enough cash for a bush plane to drop me off in this utterly stark and uninhabited coastline. I had also invested in 60 meters of thin climbing rope and a $29 small blow-up raft, lighter for backpacking than an inner tube. Uh, the river crossing presented itself on day three. It was fast with intermittent rapids, a mere 50, 60 feet or so across, and lined with bucket-sized boulders. The only place to swim across was a relatively flat 200-yard length, a half a mile above the ocean, where the river disappeared into a white waterfall of surging death waves. Just miles upstream towered the bluish head of the glacier. I stripped down to long underwear and tennis shoes, blew up the tiny two-person plastic raft and stashed my backpack. Uh, at the end of the rope, the end of the rope was securely tied to a chain of big rocks. I walked upstream carrying the raft and the rope, which I had tied in a bowline around my waist. I also had a big knife ready to cut myself loose, okay, uh, if the current was too much. I figured the rope would swing me back to shore downstream if I didn't make it, you know. And, uh, you know, a rope's length above my pack, I eased into the icy river, keeping the raft on my downstream side. I had no intention of getting in the flimsy craft. It was a flotation device. I kicked off in the rocks and side-stroked like hell for the opposite bank. In this glacial river, you had maybe 10 minutes of lucidity before, your, before hypothermia set in. I stroked vigorously, eased off and let the current carry me down below a big rock and then swam as hard as I could for the far shore. The river carried me down past my backpack. I was about to run out of rope and get swung back to the bank where I started. I gave one last desperate lunge towards the far shore, grabbed the rock, then another, and slowly pulled myself free of the icy water. I was across. Losing no time, uh, hypothermia was still a concern, I walked upstream with the raft as far as the rope could stretch. I again secured the rope to a very big rock. The rope formed an acute angle with the river it was tied across. I fastened the raft to the rope with a carabiner, hooked down to both with breakaway clips, and slid back in the water. That time I just slid right down the line, and I was across in minutes. Losing no time, uh, wait a minute, no, next paragraph. Now I was truly cold. I took a break, kindled a fire, and warmed to the task, which was getting my pack across the river. I hauled my pack and the raft as far upstream as the rope would reach, and tied it off again. This time anchored the chocks that I could dislodge once across the river by yanking uh, the rope from upstream. The backpack fit, fit awkwardly inside the raft, but I tied it in as best I could and hitched the pack each to the line. I pushed off and worked my load along the rope downstream, getting sucked under once with all my gear. Stepping out on a far bank of the icy river, I stripped off my soggy clothes and shook like a shaggy dog. Here, with my, with my modern mountaineering, mountaineering equipment and all my fancy 20th century gear, I managed to cross one very small river without drowning. The first Americans down the coast would have had many hundreds of such rivers to cross, with infants, grandparents, and all their belongings. We can only imagine. But if they traveled this route, it's hard to see how they made it without boats or practicing a maritime economy. Okay, um, since I came all this, this way to uh, Eugene with the Paisley Caves in, in mind, uh, let me just talk very briefly about it. You know, the, the, um, you guys, you know, for all I know, you're the guys that found the copper lifts. You know, they're fossilized poop. Well, they're poop about 14,000 years old, whatever you want to call that. And, uh, you know, whether they're human or not, uh, that's, you know, that's a contention that they are human and, uh, and since the contents of these, uh, um, you know, I have a question which uh, these archaeologists might be able to answer. And, uh, you know, the claim is that, uh, you know, if they're human uh, poop, if they're truly 100% human poop, you know, the bone, the hair, the vegetation of the feces uh, reflect, you know, very human diet, desert parsley. 
Uh, you know, anyway, the, 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 the upshot is that it indicates these people were not explorers, but living there at home, very well adapted to their environment. Um, okay, uh, here's my question. Um, Ed Abbey, a long time, uh, four decades ago, told me, Douglas, it's no use burying your poop in the desert because the coyotes just dig it up and eat it anyway. And, um, you know, five years of desert camping have kind of taught me that is a rule. And so, you know, my question is, you know, here's a cave that was a stop-in cave. People didn't really live there. It just, you know, the material culture doesn't indicate that, that kind of occupation. It's kind of a stop-in and, you know, you don't necessarily maintain a latrine or drive the coyotes away. And my question is, how could you possibly uh, know that uh, uh, one of these copper lifts are 100% are human? I would make the assumption the other way, that I would assume everything in that cave had passed through a coyote's digestive system. And I would also contend that morphology, after 14,000 years of insect uh, and uh, rodent gnawing, is probably not that reliable. You know, it's a questionable field of expertise anyway. And, uh, you know, I don't know how you'd prove that, you know. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, coyotes and other canines consume the scat of uh, other dogs, omnivores, and even herbivores. And in the case of a dry cave, the canine usually gets the last bite. In other words, copper lights in a desert cave could have passed through two or more digestive tracts before final deposition. Um, you know, um, you'd have to be certain the fossilized feces are entirely human, not canine or some other, some other animal. And my question is, uh, I don't know how you prove that, that's all. Um, and I'm going to briefly uh, move back to Montana and just talk a little bit, because the Anzic site also has some big problems with it. And most of the problems come from the fact that it was, uh, you know, uh, the, the collection was always in private hands and nobody took care of the bones. Uh, the bones are probably the, the skeletal remains of this young child uh, uh, went in, you know, 14 different directions, handled by dozens and dozens of people. There's probably, uh, I'm no expert on radiocarbon uh, dating uh, uh, contaminated bone, but this bone definitely uh, has seen a lot of contamination. And the radio dates are, radiocarbon dates are all over the place. So, um, but what this burial has, um, it's a total butchering kit for a mammoth hunter. And it has, you know, it has seven beautiful Clovis spear points and it has seven four shafts. You know, the four shafts are kind of double pointed, you know, dowels made of elk antler, eight of those two. And this is, it's, uh, the, the presumption is that, uh, you know, the four shafts, you mount the, the head on the four shaft and you put it in another uh, spear and you stick the animal or throw it at the animal and it's like a reloading device. You know, you have another one handy to go on to it. But anyway, all of these, um, all of these four shafts in Montana are made of elk handler. Now, elk uh, have not always been here. They came to North America very recently, about the time of th this last global warming, 14.7 thousand years ago. So they were in Alaska, isolated from the lower 48 by the glaciers until the glaciers open. Now, the radiocarbon date, which is the best thing, I, I know this is getting a little technical. I'm gonna, I'll tell jokes and show movies from, that, from now on, but this is the last thing. But, um, <laughs> You know, the radiocarbon data in this thing makes it a little more than 13,000 years old. And, um, and it's elk. Well, look at, you know, human beings, you're talking about, you know, a route that an animal can use. Well, a grizzly bear, we know, the, uh, we know humans could have come down before the glacier closed because the grizzly bear did it, you know? And grizzly bears don't move very fast. Uh, they, it's a home range of a single female. It's about 20 miles every five years. That's a long time. Elk move a little faster, but, you know, the assumption that an elk came down from Alaska, it take, you know, your guess is good at mine, but it would take a couple hundred years of revegetation, you know, to feed the elk and then for the elk to make the journey down to Montana. So that, you know, that's pretty solid evidence. That radiocarbon data is just about a year old. But, you know, we've, we've got also other problems. And, you know, this collection is, you know, they made these projectile points out of the most spectacular uh, lithic material, you know, agates and jasper and, and beautiful stuff. Well, in the Anzic collection, most of the artifacts come from four or five lithic sites, and, and my friend, the archaeologist, knows where they are. They're close by, and one could go to those sites and excavate and, and 
possibly find the origins of Clovis technology, a very big archaeological mystery and stuff like that. Um, and also there's no obsidian in that. I, you know, you find obsidian, it's the most commonly used material in the yellow, you know, greater Yellowstone area. There's not an obsidian uh, tool in this thing, that, which means to me they hadn't found, you know, the uh, obsidian cliffs in Yellowstone Park is a place that's been used for 11,000 years, but they didn't get there yet. Um, Let's watch a little bear footage. I had to fulfill my promise to cover that material, and, and it's, just, it's always a little longer than you think. Um, like I say, since it's frozen on that frame, that's way too close to get to a grizzly bear. You know, I knew, you know, I, I filmed grizzly bears for well, 15 years. I had an old spring wound Bolex camera, 16 millimeter, it was really noisy. It was hard to get close to bears, and I don't like to bother bears. I never filmed from roads, I never filmed around other people. I had all these stupid rules set up for myself, and uh, you know, I don't do that kind of thing, you know, sort of kind of snobbish, I guess. Uh, but, uh, so I needed some, you know, because I was making a film, and you know, I did a film with Arnold Schwarzenegger, I had a nature film called Peacock's War, and, you know, but I needed a few close-ups, and I didn't want to go to dumps, and I didn't want to go around other people. So I went up to near Glacier Park Chalet in Glacier, because I knew there was a beautiful bear up there, and she was used to people. And I spent a whole week looking for this bear, and I found her on the seventh day, and I started to work her, you know, working upwind, trying to get close, and n nothing, nothing doing. And then finally the wind shifted. She got my scent, and she walked right up on me. I mean, first she walked, and she bedded 60 feet away under a little tiny tree. You know, it didn't make any sense at all, it, you know. And then she walked right up to me. And that's the moment of truth when I stepped away from the camera and talked to that bear because, you know, you can see front, that frontal orientation and the fact that she's drawing her mouth. I mean, that's, uh, that's confrontational. And, you know, she hasn't decided whether she's gonna, uh, you know, grant me a quarter or chew my ass off, quite frankly. And uh, so I stepped away from the camera, like I always do with bears, and I don't look at them, you know, but I talk to them softly, and, uh, and I hold my arms out. I don't know what that does, but I do it anyway. <laughs> and, and, then, and then she turned around and, uh, well, hell, we can play movie footage now. She turned away and started to graze and dig like six feet away from me. I could have reached out and slapped her on the ass. It's called displacement behavior, you know, kind of a response inappropriate to stimuli. Hey, let's, uh, let's do this. Okay. Anyway, all of this footage, you can see it's, it's old, you know, it's old work print, right? It's just 16 miller work print, all scratched up, spliced, hand spliced by me. Uh, that's a very big and dominant grizzly. You know, in the context of a gathering for huckleberries, to see a bear walk across the middle of an open ground means it's a very dominant, secure bear. And bears do form these social hierarchies, you know, that the brown salmon streams, the old garbage dump, and to a lesser extent, they do it around rich food sources. You know, the, 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 the abundance of food breaks down their mutual intolerance towards each other. Now, this bear doesn't know I'm there. She walked, I'm on a steep hillside. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm on a steep hillside. Uh, the cub knows something's over there. He says, Mom, there's a geek with a camera over there. You know, and I'm caught on this steep hillside. And, uh, you know, so I just keep the camera record because if I'm going to get my tush chewed off, I want a record in living color. So I'm talking to the bear but not moving. And she's trying to decide what to do. I don't think she's probably ever seen a human before. It's a young mother. And, you know, when she looks off to the side like that, you know you've got a chance. She's trying to resolve... I mean, all she cares about is her cub. She didn't care about you at all. As long as her cub is secure and you're not a threat. Uh, but that's when you get charged. And if you, you know, if you run or try to climb a tree or resist in any way, you'll get nailed. And if you fight back, the bear will keep chewing on you until you can't fight back anymore. Uh, the opposite is also true. If you play dead, you won't get chewed on much. And don't ever run or try to climb a tree. But see, I'm just talking. I'd say, Mom, it's just a, I'm just over here just... Just, just shooting this, uh, holding this camera here. Uh, don't mean to disturb you. But anyway, that's the resolution you want to see. Bear tushes <laughs> disappearing into the bear grass. OK. 
Okay, now I said a, a frontal uh, orientation is a dominant bear. No, not one bear out of 100 would do that to me. I got the hell out of the mountain that same day. See what he's looking at me? Anyway, uh, bears are very powerful animals, and they like, they like grass. They like berries, but I mean, largely they live on grass much of the year. Grass and sedge and, and plants in their pre-flowering stages. You know, they're, they're wonderful omnivores. You know, they, live, they eat a lot of meat, but it's mainly insects. You know, they'll eat a carcass. They do kill, you know, calves of moose and elk. And, and they get a, a adult elk in the spring and during the rut when, you know, bulls are sort of cow struck and not very alert. Uh, they get bull elks uh, during, during the fall. And uh, they'll get, I knew one Yellowstone bear that got, uh, was able to predate on yearling moose and bison. It was only, you know, that's, that's kind of a big animal. But they're not an effective predator. They couldn't stay out all winter. You know, when only the, the yellow cellulose of winter grass is available, they have to den up and hibernate. And, you know, the fact that uh, the short-faced bear didn't make it through, you know, the, 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 the great cooling of, of the younger dryas and the grizzly did, I think it's a simple relationship. The short-faced bear was a total uh, carnivore in terms of eating carrion and maybe doing a little predation. And the grizzly is a very flexible, adaptable uh, omnivore that can live on pure vegetation when necessary. This guy's just breaking the ice. He's one of my favorite bears in the world. I call him Happy Bear. I visited him for 17 years in a row up in Glacier Park. And he's just breaking the ice in the morning. Sometimes he looks, now usually it's hard to tell an adult male from a female, even an expert, but that's not a very dignified shot, but you could probably sex that bear. <laughs> now here's that great predator of Yellowstone, the one that knocked off yearling moose, which he'd get on the snow, because the bears have a plantigrade stance, you know, and, and, and they can walk across a snow drift that I would wallow in, you know, because they distribute their weight, and that's how they get moose. And he also killed yearling bison. He was about the only one. He was one of the last survivors, an old big bear. He survived the pogroms of the late 60s and early 70s, you know, when they weaned Yellowstone bears from, from garbage and they all went into town sites and they, 278 got killed in five year period. That's a lot of bears. This bear set up an ambush for me in the snow. The first time I saw him, <clears throat> this is a thermal area. That's why there's no snow. But there's actually four feet of snow out in the woods. So he went out following my snowshoe trail just at dusk. And, and, you know, I waited about a half an hour and I started to follow him out. I could see his tracks on top of my snowshoe track. And I got an eerie feeling and I just, I got the hell out of there. I went back and I set up, I went around the hill and set up camp. Next morning I went out and followed the tracks. He'd gone out about 100 feet, circled around and had bedded behind a log 10 feet from that trail. And the bed was icy, like, you know, he was there for quite a long time. Anyway, uh, carrion in Yellowstone is real important. You know, winter killed bison and elk. And uh, bears like your uh, golden retriever just love to roll in rotten salmon and other dead things. <laughs> now, this is the same bear, right? And see, I spliced this together myself. You can see it's an amateur's job and it spliced them. But look at, you know, she's pretending to dig and I'm only five, six feet away. I had to back away from her to focus the lens on her. And uh, anyway... I, uh, I had about uh, two minutes of film. I shot it all and I quit for the year. I figured that's, that's enough. You know, I don't like disturbing bears and that's way too close to get to any bear, even though this was a bear that it was certainly used to human beings a little bit. And of course, up in, up in Glacier, uh, huckleberries, you know, uh, Yellowstone is a white bark pine nut ecosystem, you know, and, and it's, which is a stone pine. The, the, the closest ecosystem to Yellowstone is in Siberia. Uh, global warming, pine beetle has moved up a life zone in Yellowstone and, and over 95% of all the white bark pine trees are dead or dying. It's gone forever during our lifetime anyway as a food source to grizzlies. And you know, all of that means that the temperatures have risen since uh, since 2002, because what kept the pine beetle down there were freezing cold nights of 30, 35 below for four or five nights in a row, you know, at 9,000 feet. And the temperature uh, in the last uh, 10 years has, has warmed up enough to allow uh, 
the pine be able to thrive at the highest altitudes in uh, Yellowstone where pine trees grow. And you know, grizzly bears love to play when they're, you know, modern biology doesn't get to do much of that because we're so busy, you know, snaring and radio collaring and tracking from satellite. But I mean, just w watching bears at their leisure was the, probably the greatest joy of my life. You know, none of these bears see me except that one that was way too close and that other one that looked at me. And I'm up on a ridge looking down. Now there's another, that's a mother bear. She's got two yearlings and she smells, she smells the bear that I called the black grizzly in grizzly years. That's a bear that had it in for me and for good reason. But look at her, she's running up a steep, you know, avalanche slope that's full of logs and you know, all the mythology about grizzlies not being able to run up or downhill, that's, that's totally a lie. They run up or down faster than you can believe. In Denali, a ranger clocked a pair at 42 miles an hour. I mean, Carl Lewis did 26, you know. That, that's fast, it's fast. And uh, again, here's a, that's a little tiny cub, and you can see the mother's kind of nervous. Uh, this, uh, this is up by the Grizzly Hill, and it's a place that I, you know, that I, that I go to because, you know, there's no way to get to it. And there's a ridge where I could film the bears without disturbing them. The, the winds blew my current away, and, I, you know, and I'm up on top. You can see I'm looking down a little bit. And they spend so much, I mean, when they're not feeding and bedding, they just love to play. They just play all the time. They play as yearlings, you know, they, they play as family groups, they play as brother and sister, and... I've got footage finally in here of Happy Bear, who's an adult, uh, adult male grizzly, and he's the most amazingly playful, joyful animal I've, I've ever known. See, uh, you know, this gets a little uh, rough with age, you know. It's, uh, you know, you can see the overhead cross coming down. At, uh, you know, some people think this is rehearsal for future roles, but quite frankly, it's just, uh, there's, it's just fun. See the wind blow across water? I love that. Remind them way, I'll just get out of here. But this was probably, you know, I was lucky enough to spend several decades mostly alone, you know, living in, the, in wild grizzly country just watching these animals. I didn't always film them, but I, I go back. I haven't, actually, I quit filming them in 1982. I mean, I've gone back, you know, every year since then, but I, I don't even take their picture anymore. I just kind of make sure they're there. See, the mom playing with one of her yearlings, bad filmmaking from the place to scene. You know, man, you know, my whole camera rig you know, with a tripod and a long lens that I, I made a deal with ABC Sports and it weighed 98 pounds. Now they got video cameras that are 10 times as good for the weight of pound. This is my favorite happy bear. See, he's trying to get up on the ice and he's kind of goofy. He's sort of a goofy bear. I mean, he's a big bear, but look at him. He's just having a ball. And he's up on a slab of avalanche snow that's lasted all winter, you know, in this little shallow tarn. And in the, there he is, just busting the ice. He loves to bust the ice. <laughs> and, you know, maybe he's looking at his reflection. up a block of ice and he'd do this almost every morning come out a little bit of it's cold you know I'm up there it's it's late September by now in the high countries you know the, the berries are beginning to fail because when you get a freezing frost in the high country the berries tend to soften and drop off and after that is actually a pretty dangerous time in the high country there's a lot of intense competition for fall forage zones in glacier that means you know high alpine areas with lots of corms and tubers you know the the field you see all plowed up, you know, grizzlies have these prodigious claws and, you know, the high country is, just looks like it's, it's plowed sometimes. And what they're doing is they're digging largely the corms of spring beauties, claytonia, and, and a number of other lilies, uh, glacier lilies, mariposa lilies. 
Uh, but, you know, also lots of roots, biscuit root, down in Yellowstone. Look at that guy. I mean, he's just he's trying to break the ice again. And, you know, and, and there he is. He's on this great slab of snow that other bears have been out here. There's tracks all over the place. You know, I'm about to look at, look at that. I mean, you know, put that on your computer. And, and also out on this great slab of ice are the scats of other bears. Grizzly bears, every grizzly knows every other grizzly in the, in the, you know, like in the, in the context of this little social gathering and how to respond, you know, whether it's the dominant or subordinate. Oh, Jesus Christ, smells like Sam. Oh, no. <laughs> And he does a dance of joy. <laughs> and he's still walking up on this slab. And, uh oh, another pile of bear poop. Oh my God. And he knows it's Charlie. Where is that son of a gun? You know, I think we can. Uh, I think we can run that down. You can shut it down if you would, please. Yeah, happy bear. I'm going to read one last, very short piece. It's about Ed Abbey. If I can get to the bottom of my pile here. Oh boy. Okay, let's see here. It's got to be here. Or I can tell a story if I don't find the son of a gun. You'd think I'd get better at this. Okay. Um, you know, um, I was with Ed Abbey when he when he died, and he died heroically, and uh, wouldn't have anything to do with. Uh, you know, he wouldn't have anything to do with dying in a hospital full of tubes and breathing devices and shit like that. He, uh, you know, I, I talked him into to, to medical procedures for the sake of his kids, and I felt really ashamed of it, and I went in, and, and actually, it took me that long, you know, to tell, I went and tell him I loved him. And, uh, and uh, he'd ripped out all the tubes, ripped them, all the tubes and needles, and he said, Douglas, it's time to go, you know? So we piled him in a pickup, and uh, started to head out to the desert so he could die in a decent desert place, you know. And uh, we crossed the railroad, and Clark, his wife, uh, pulled over and stopped me. He said, Douglas, he's going fast. So I picked another place, a place where I used to go camping by myself when I needed a break, just on the edge of Tucson. But it was still a decent place to die. And uh, so we took old Ed out there, and, uh, you know, it was towards morning, maybe 4 in the morning, and... Uh, and I built him a little tiny fire, you know. I built him a little mesquite fire, and we got his camp chair, and he sat around the fire for 15, 20 minutes. He's really tired. He's, he'd been bleeding out from his throat. And, uh, and I finally decided it was time to go, and so he got in the sleeping bag, and Clark got in the sleeping bag with him. And, you know, uh, we all went over and shook hands and said, goodbye, Ed, you know. And uh, there was Jack Leffler and uh, Steve, Steve Prescott, his brother-in-law, and myself. And, uh, you know, and then we went and waited and waited. And... Uh, you know, the sun started to come up, and the sun did come up, and I kind of peeked over, and I saw a little movement. And uh, I went over to, to see if he's dead yet, and he looked up at me, and he said, Douglas, sometimes the magic doesn't work. <laughs> no, he did die a couple of days later. And here, I'll just read this. The last time Ed Abbey smiled was when I told him where he was going to be buried. 
And I smile too when I think of this small favor, this last simple task friends can do for one another. The rudimentary shovel work, this sweaty labor consummating trust, finally testing the exact confirmation by lying down in the freshly dug grave to check out the view. Bronze patina boulder beyond limb of Palo Verde and turquoise, turquoise sky beyond branch of Torote. Then receiving a sign, seven buzzards soaring above, joined by three others. All ten banking over the volcanic rubble and riding the thermal up the flank of the mountain, gliding out over the distant valley and wanted to be reincarnated as a buzzard. Even three years later, that's when I wrote this, I grin as I crest the ridge above his grave. The earth falls away and the mountain range stretch off into the great distance as far as the eye can see. There is not a human sign or sound, only a faint desert breeze stirring the blossoms of brittle bush. We should be so lucky. On the eve of March 16th, I journeyed to the edge of, the, of this desert place. March 16th is the day of the dead for me, uh, the anniversary of the My Lai massacre. Uh, I flew over when it was happening on my last day out of Vietnam. I didn't know that till a year later when I saw Life magazine. Those pictures changed my life. And I was there in November. I started, I went back to Vietnam. First place I went was Mila. I was on Veterans Day. But anyway, okay. Uh, the Day of the Dead, for me, the anniversary of the Mila massacre. And also the day in 1989, three friends and myself buried Ed Abbey here, illegally, in accordance with his last wishes. I had traveled out here alone to Ed's grave, bearing little gifts, including a bottle of mezcal and a bowl of pozole verde. I had made myself. I'm a good cook. I sat quietly on the black volcanic rocks, listening to the desert silence, pouring mezcal over the grave and down my throat until the moon came up an hour or so before midnight. Suddenly, I heard the commotion to the south, the roar of basaltic scree, thundering down the slope opposite me. A large, solitary animal was heading my way. I got the hell out of there. Two days later, I told the story of the desert bighorn ram I heard but never saw to my poet friend, Jim Harrison. He's from Michigan. He said, well, Doug, Jim said, maybe it was old Ed. Thank you. Thanks for hanging around. I know it's a little long. Um, we, we do have questions if anybody wants to initiate that uh, process. Who's the boss here? Who's running this show? Julia? Anyone with a question? And we have a book signing too yep. if you want to hang around for we that. We have a question here. Um, what's the green bone and what's it used for? Excuse me? Uh, you mentioned something that the old people, <laughs> people long ago, used green bone or black Oh, bone? yeah, I mean just green bone because it burns better, you know? Bone burns really hot. It's a great, makes a great fire. And, you know, the, the green, I meant, you know, like a green fracture. That means, you know, the bone of something recently killed, and there's a lot of fat in it. It's a fat that burns hot. So, uh, you know, a freshly killed bone is better than an old bone. That's all. Hi, Ed. Uh, this was great tonight. Uh, this morning, uh, your lecture to us students was really cool. Um, hearing about uh, a little bit of a different story tonight was interesting. I have to say that um, for all of you that haven't seen the Arnold Schwarzenegger footage, I hope that goes on YouTube because it's really funny. Um, well, but... Peacock, Vera Ziberes. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, That's reading, true, he said that. Yeah. Uh, so reading the book, uh, Grizzly Years, yeah. I kind of have put some connections together with what you said tonight about um, how in Vietnam you were, you know, you'd go out on these patrols and you'd walk around with, with the group and, and you kind of stayed in the same area all the time. You knew which, which hills to go to, where the enemy wouldn't be. And... Uh, 
then talking about um, the archaeological side 13,000 years ago, how, you know, maybe people, how, how would people have moved and did they stay in the same place or were they able, like, you know, elk, did they get to other places? Grizzlies, were they able to cross these barriers? And so I just, I'm wondering, what, what, how do you think that, I mean, you say that maybe it was by boat, but what does that mean in the context of climate change, of how, how we move past? Uh, a, a, a passage down the coast, or whoever came here, everything depended upon climate change. You know, the earth started to warm up, you know, it was very cold. The height of the ice age was in this continent 18, 19,000 years ago. About 15,000 years ago, a warm spell came and melted the glaciers that blocked the passageway down from Alaska. It also melted the glaciers that went out into the Pacific Ocean, blocking any route down the coast. And when they receded, you know, people made their move. Now, you know, in terms of direct parallel, there's no data, there's no evidence, so it's all speculative. But I think it's worth thinking about, you know, how, how, you know, and it's not measurable, you know. The, I, I can imagine a great amount of human evolution happening in, in those few thousand years, and most of it would be reflected in the human mind, in the human consciousness, and w with our clumsy tools of analysis, we can only guess at that. There's no straight answer to your question. OK. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ed. Yeah. Any other questions? How are you doing? OK. Uh, thank you for coming here. We enjoyed your lecture. Um, and the footage of the bear, great, no doubt. Uh, what I would like to know is, um, as the poles are melting exponentially uh, fast, if people understand progressive uh, exponential mathematics, it's happening faster and faster every day. I think... Yeah, see, see you guys. I think the Mayans... If, if we continue this path that we're on and don't make any changes, are you with me in thinking that the Mayans Well, I don't know pretty much the Mayans, but I know that we're screwed, for sure. Yeah, because in, like, um, in 05, Time Magazine has done an excellent job of covering global climate change and global warming. And their last one in 05... On the front cover was a picture of a polar bear standing on a piece of ice with water surrounding all oh, around. That's a tragic image. You know, um, you want to come up and talk to me. I noticed people. Uh, you want to, I'm going to sign some books. Why don't we just come up and talk? You want to discuss this in front of everybody? Well, I just wanted to. Uh, okay, what's a good question then? Get your your opinion on um, as as time goes on and we don't change anything, do you see uh, life coming to a close within a year? Not a year, but by the end of the century, uh, oh. we're really looking at the end of civilization as we know it. Yeah, I, I, I find it. I really do believe that, uh, you know, that uh, the great bread baskets of Asia and Africa, that uh, the heat is going to, bake agriculture out of those places. Yeah. And, you know, uh, a billion Chinese are going to go to, uh, you know, industrial farms in the gulags of Siberia um, to find food and, you know, and who knows? They'll nuke it out. Yeah. Could be, it could be any scene, but it's, it's bleak. The f we're doing nothing. And uh, we're so insulated by our material comfort and in our economic... Uh, blankets that uh, we do not see the saber tooth in the bush. And I am writing this book because of that, and I know there's not a very convincing series of parallel arguments here, you know. But, you know, I'm, the, the search is how do we perceive risk in this modern world, so insulated as we are, yeah. you know? It's happening to strangers across the, con across the world, you know? It's, you got to care about the grandchildren of some uh, Indian farmer. 
to But we don't. To get through uh, this. You know, this is mass consumerism, and I, population explosion is the number one. Why don't we address population as a tax incentive to have I, I less agree with people? You, totally. You know, that's the whole problem right there. But anyway, I'm, I think we'll just sign some books. Is that okay yeah. with everybody? Thank you. Yeah. And listen, if you want to talk to me or ask questions, come up. Thank you so much.